how the church and Robert have come together and how God has led in that process and the blessing that we hope Robert will be to this fellowship and how the fellowship will also be a blessing to Robert. As we come this afternoon, it's a privilege to welcome you all here, to welcome uh, Martin Hudson from Baptist Union, who's come to perform the ordination and the act of introduction. To Daniel, you'll not forget Daniel once you're here. <laughs> I've already met Daniel a couple of times, and uh, so Daniel Pollan is from the uh, community, community church. So he's going to share God's word with us a little later this afternoon. Uh, and then following the service here, we invite you all to join with us down at the Capstone Centre at the far end of our high street. So if we're not from the area, back down the hill, left, over the bridge, up to the far end of the high street, there's a war memorial. Directly on your left of that place is the Capstone Centre. There's two car parks, one just past it on your left, and one directly opposite down to the railway station. So there's plenty of parking, and there is one or two spaces behind the capsule itself, if you're quick. <laughs> I probably forgot to say something, no matter. Our call to worship. Psalm 150 says, Praise the Lord, praise God in his sanctuary, praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power, praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and lyre. Praise him with pampering and dancing. Praise him with strings and flute. Praise him with the clash of cymbals. Praise him with sounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. <coughs> I hope you're all in a good voice this afternoon. We will be sharing in praise uh, shortly. But as I read some scripture, I can find my place, uh, I'm going to read uh, from Romans uh, chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Change glasses. Old age is a terrible thing. <laughs> I have two pair of reading glasses, one for mid-distance and one for short. And, uh, but distance, I'm fine. That's better. Romans chapter 12. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment, in accordance with the measure of faith, God has given you. Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, then let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is in contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is in leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is in showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honour one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervour serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, <coughs> faithful in prayer. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. 
Bless and, <coughs> bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. <coughs> do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. <coughs> if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And may the Lord have his blessing to the beauty of his word. Just before we come to sing some praise, as you leave uh, the hall this afternoon, don't be embarrassed if you hand a little card. It's just asking you to remember to pray for Robert and Gemma as they start this new venture. So do take one of these cards with you. Keep it in your wallet, keep it in your purses, keep it stuck to your fridge. But use it and pray for Robert and Gemma in the coming days.
Robert is being ordained as a minister in the Baptist Union of Scotland. And so I'm going to invite you to come and join me at the front now, Robert. And uh, why don't you begin just by telling us something of how God has led you to this point? Well, wow. <laughs> Good afternoon, first and foremost. Um, how did a Balamina man end up in the middle of the Highlands? That's a good question. Um, yeah, it starts off uh, during primary school and high school. Um, I didn't have it that easy. Um, I, I struggled my way through that. And for me, I found that quite difficult. And I was challenged in many different ways. And uh, at that point in my life, I felt that I needed some help, and so I was challenging God as to, well, you say that you're this God that can do great and wonderful things. Prove it. Here I am. Do what you like. <laughs> Never say that. <laughs> Don't expect something to happen. But I had wonderful aspirations after uh, high school. I wanted to be the next Gordon Ramsay without the swearing. Uh, I wanted to be the best cordon blue chef that I could be. Um, if you ask my parents, the first major feel for me was making lasagna without tomato sauce. Uh, and then if you ask Daniel, during Bible college I made scrambled eggs that looked like runny porridge. You probably see why God didn't let me go down that route. But growing up in a, a housing scheme in Northern Ireland, um, I came across a team of Americans who were working with the local church there, a local Brethren Hall, and uh, I got to be associated with these uh, Americans, and um, they started to really impact my life, and I had wonderful opportunity uh, to serve and, and to grow and to learn under Pastor Steve Burton who is watching this in, or in Alabama. And Steve gave me the opportunity to go to America and to serve there and do the work of catering in uh, the galleys, as a galley slave, wonderful terminology I know. And I served there, and while I was there, I had this very strong uh, sense of God telling me, I want you to go to Bible college to study. Um, and I knew that, that was going to be difficult for me, um, it wasn't going to be easy, and so I decided, why not? And so I, I applied to Belfast Bible College and I studied there uh, till 2009, and during that time I began uh, to lose my hearing and had a, a profound bilateral deafness. And again, this was a challenge to me, and I'm like, do I really want to do this? Am I really willing? to do all this. And I, I withdrew from study in 2009 and I went back to, to work uh, in the, the normal uh, sector of work. But while I was there I still got this sense of God telling me to go back to study. And in 2012 I decided to test that war once again and God opened the doors for me to study at the Irish Bible Institute in Dublin. And so I did that for a year. Daniel had uh, been called to Coastline, and me and Daniel had studied at Belfast, and I sat down beside Daniel <coughs> the first day, told him all my problems, and have been doing it ever since. <laughs> That's what best friend is. <laughs> and in 2012, uh, there was a mission team had come over from Kentucky, and me enjoying everything American decided I'll gladly go help Daniel. At that time, Coastline Community Church were looking for a new youth worker. And during that week, four different people had asked me what I considered, and I went, no thank you, quite happy in Dublin studying. And I got home and there was an email from a deacon's wife in my email box and couple letters playing, saying, please, 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 would you consider being a youth worker at Coastline Community Church? And I went, okay. So I phoned Daniel and we had a conversation about that. And uh, during that time I met my then-to-be wife. And uh, so there was a twofold purpose of going to Coastline. And so 
God was very gracious and he called me to Coastline to serve as a youth worker. And while I did that, I completed my studies in, at the Scottish Baptist College. And it was during the ministry at Coastline and with that <coughs> and with the other deacons there that we discerned a call to full-time pastoral minister. And uh, if you ever want a life experience, never go to the board of ministry unless you're prepared for it. For two days, I spent uh, time with brothers and sisters within the Baptist Union of Scotland being questioned and uh, or uh, grilled on different aspects of that and uh, after the, the second day with around 24 of them asking quick fire questions they deemed that they also too sensed the call of God on my life to pastoral ministry and so that began the journey to this point today. Thank you, Robert. What a great story and what good work God has been doing in your life. We'll give you an opportunity a bit later on to bring it right up to date and tell us how you were called to all that. But today, you're being ordained as a minister in respect to that call which has been recognised by yourself and has been recognised by our family of churches through the Board of Ministry. So, Robert, you can only fulfil the ministry to which you're being set apart in humble dependence on God in sincerity of purpose and holiness of life. So we invite you to declare your faith in Christ and acceptance of this ministry in the presence of God before these representatives of God's people by answering these questions. Robert, do you believe in one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, and do you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour? I do. This in the God in whom I trust. Jesus said, the greatest among you must be the servant of all. Do you believe that you are called by God to servant leadership in our Baptist family of churches? I believe that God has called me. Jesus commissioned us to preach the good news and make disciples everywhere. Will you proclaim the good news through word and deed, relying on the power of the Holy Spirit, making disciples and seeking the coming of God, the kingdom of God? As a disciple of Jesus Christ, I will call others to follow him. Jesus said, feed my sheep. In your ministry, will you be diligent in your study of scripture to play your part in the nourishment and nurture of the flock of God? Trust in the Lord as my shepherd, I will. Jesus taught his disciples to pray and not give up. Will you be constant in encouraging God's people in prayer? and cultivating a life of prayer yourself. By God's grace, I will. And Jesus challenged his disciples to leave self behind, to take up their cross and to follow after him. Are you determined to walk this path, even though you do not know where it leads? With the Lord's help, I am. Thank you. You're being commissioned as a minister within the Baptist Union of Scotland. Let me read to you our Declaration of Principle, which describes our shared core convictions. Then invite you to confirm these are also your beliefs. Our Scottish Baptist Declaration of Principle declares that the Lord Jesus Christ, our God and Saviour, is the sole and absolute authority in all matters pertaining to faith and practice, as revealed in the Holy Scriptures, and that each church has liberty, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, to interpret and administer his laws. That Christian baptism is immersion in water into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, of those who have professed repentance towards God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for our sins according to the scriptures, was buried and rose again on the third day, and that it is the duty of every disciple to bear witness to the gospel of Jesus Christ and to take part in the evangelization of the world. Robert, are you in wholehearted agreement with this statement? I am. Good. Please, will you all stand? I am going to ask you a question, and if you are able, I would invite you to respond, we do. As members of this church, Robert's previous churches 
and as friends gathered to support him today, do you believe that God has called him to Christian ministry and do you acknowledge him as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ? We do. Thank you. And invite those who are going to lay hands on Robert now to come and join us on the platform. Others, please be seated. <coughs> And can I ask you to perhaps Robert if you step forward a little and if uh, you'd like to gather around Robert and lay hands on him on behalf of us all as a sign of our blessing of Rob, Robert, as a sign <coughs> that in the biblical principle of laying on hands, we are joining in prayer to commission and ordain Robert to ministry. So let us pray. God our Father. We thank you for the call you have placed upon Robert's life. For the evidence of that in Robert's testimony. For the testing of that through our board of ministry. Through the practice of that in the working out of ministry at Coastline and now here. We ask now, Lord Jesus, that... You will come upon Robert in a new way. That your Holy Spirit will equip and enable him for the work of ministry. That the seed of desire in his heart will grow now and in the years ahead into a fruitful and rich ministry in which Jesus is honoured and in which your church is built up. We pray that you will give Robert such a love of your word that his teaching and preaching overflow with truth and joy. We pray that you will give Robert such a love of your people that the very compassion of Jesus <coughs> overflows from him. We pray that you will give Robert a love for the lost such that in words and actions he is able to gather people to you who, by your grace, will respond to your saving message. Lord, let your Holy Spirit come upon Robert this day in mighty power, equipping, anointing, enabling and enriching him for the ministry that lies ahead. In Jesus' name, Amen. 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 Robert, recognising your faith, your call, your love for Jesus and his church, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and on behalf of the churches of the Scottish Baptist Union, I ordain you to the work of ministry. May the Lord bless you. continues as we sing together. So I invite the band to come and lead us once again. <laughs>
take me and hide me behind your son. May your words flow from us and may you bless each and every one of us this day, we pray. Not for our sake, Lord, but for yours. If you're difficult to understand my accent, don't worry, you won't be the first person nor the last. There was one time when I was travelling from Belfast back to Pitt and Weem and I was in the Stendaline terminal waiting for my boat. And as happens to me, I started talking to this man beside me. And we were talking backwards and forwards. And he said to me, Daniel, what do you do? And I said, oh, I, I, I pastor a church. And the man swore at me and said, I do the same thing. And I thought this was a bit strange, because in Northern Ireland, we're not used to our ministers of our families. So the guy went along and we talked about bit and I was trying to sense what church he was with. Maybe it was Presbyterian or something, I don't know. So we're trying to figure out... <laughs> trying to figure out what church he was with. So we talked a bit more. He said, well, um, so what church do you pastor? I said, I'm pastoring a church on the East Newt of Fife. He goes, you know what? I'm plastering a church in St. Andrews. <laughs> pastor at all, he was a pastor. <laughs> but what is a pastor? What does it mean to pastor church? Today, if you're with us for the first time, and this is your first time in church or in a service like this, you're very welcome, but you're probably wondering, what are they talking about? What does it mean to pastor church? What does, what does ordination, what does induction, what does all this mean? I heard one of the ladies coming in the door saying that she told her friend she was away to an abduction service today. <laughs> instead of abduction. What does it all mean? And what is it all about for Alness and for Robert? Well, there's a beautiful bit of God's Word that if you've got a Bible, please turn to it in John 21. John 21, if you're of a certain age, please turn in your Bible. And if you're of a certain age, please turn on your Bible as we come to John 21. It's a beautiful section. I just want to look at a conversation between Jesus and Peter. This takes place after Peter had let the Lord down. And it's, this is Peter's restoration. But in this... There's a lesson for us to learn, because Peter then went on to pastor and shepherd for his church. So let's look here and see what Jesus says to Peter. Turn with me, John 21, verse 15. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Peter said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. Jesus asked him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because Jesus had said to him the third time, do you love me? He said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep, truly, truly, I said to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This Jesus said to show by what kind of death Peter would glorify God with. And after he said this to him, he said, follow me. <coughs> Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved and had leaned back on him during supper and said, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw me, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if, if it's my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. <coughs> so the sign spread among the brothers that this disciple was not yet to die. Yet Jesus did not say that he was not to die, but if it is my will that you remain, he remained I come, what is that to you? Now this is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things and who has written these things, and these things we know are true. Now if there were many things that Jesus did other than this, were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that they knew of. This is the word of the Lord. Today, today we come to our dear Robert's commission into this church, but it's not about Robert today. It's not even about all Ness Baptist Church. It's not even about the Baptist Church of Scotland. It's not even about me or Northern Ireland. It is about one person in particular, and that is Jesus Christ. I don't know what the name Jesus Christ means to you, for some it may name it. A term that we use casually to, to, to use things that may be somebody who has a nice distant figure off in the past, who has historical importance. But today, when we read John's Gospel, we see Jesus coming to us as a real, living, breathing, alive person. When we read this part of John's Gospel, Jesus has just been to the cross. He has just died there on a cross, as John said, because he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, 
Whosoever should believe him would not perish but have eternal life. Jesus went to the cross and he died. But something more amazing than that happened a few days later. He walked out of the grave. He was resurrected, as we say. He came alive and God brought him back to life alive and well and fully brave. So much so that he cooked breakfast for the disciples. It's like great. I think it's sort of God who cooks your breakfast. <laughs> Cook breakfast for the disciples. He walked among them. He was alive back from the dead. This figure, Jesus, comes to us real, living, alive in history, space, and time. I could take you to the grave of Gautama Buddha. I could take you to the grave of Muhammad. I could even take you to the grave of King David. But I cannot take you to the grave of Jesus Christ because his grave is empty. Hallelujah. Jesus is alive. And what that means for all of us this morning, Christian, non-Christian, Scotsman, Englishman, or even the Irish, is that we have to reckon with this figure, Jesus Christ, because nobody else has come back from the grave. Nobody else has been resurrected. If God, if Jesus wanted to be claimed to be, do you think that God would have raised him from the dead? No. Because I would be proving that he was true, but the fact that God did raise him from the dead shows that everything Jesus said was true, everything he did was real, and he is God's only son, the saviour of the world, the one in whom we must respond to this morning. So friend, if, you, if you've never heard that about Jesus Christ before, please come, come to this church. It's a wonderful church. It's got lovely tea. Come and hear about Jesus. Robert will be starting a series next Sunday preaching on Jesus. Come and listen and find out more. But for us as Christians this morning, I really want to talk to the church. How do we respond to Jesus? <coughs> How do we respond to Jesus? How does Robert respond to Jesus? We see that here in the conversation with Simon Peter. Some commentators say that Jesus asked Peter three times, do you know maybe because Peter betrayed him three times? You know that, that very powerful scene where Peter says, I don't know Jesus. The young servant girl asks Peter, says, I don't know Jesus. And then lastly says, I don't know Jesus. And the cock crows. But I think there's more to it than that. There's more to it than that. Parents here this, the, this afternoon, how many times have you asked your kids to do something before they do it? Lots. <laughs> you know those conversations, I used to have up with my mother, Daniel, have you tidied your room yet? Yes, mom, the room's beautiful. Daniel, have you tidied your room yet? Yes, mom, the room's beautiful. Daniel, you'll get no dinner. Have you tidied the room yet? No. In a more deep and profound way here, I think Jesus asked him three times because this length of betrayal is, but also because he wants to get to Peter's heart. Because Christianity is not an external religion just of the head, but it's a religion of the heart. It's a faith of the heart. It's living. It draws a response from mind, body, and soul. All the way back in the Old Testament, God had said that the people of Israel love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. And Jesus is looking through Peter here because Peter, Peter was an Ulsterman. Every time he opened his mouth, his foot was on him. <laughs> He really was. Lord, I love you more than these. Lord, I will do great things for you. And he betrays him because a servant girl says, are you with Jesus? Jesus is coming through Peter's bluster and he's saying, Peter, the true response of a disciple, the true response of somebody who follows Christ, the true response to somebody who me, I have loved you, Peter, I have given my life for you and I am back from the dead and I want to know, do you love me? And this isn't just Peter that says this. We hear this remarkable passage many times. Let me read this to you. You've heard this many times. But listen to this. If I speak in the tongues of men and of the angels but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge and have all faith so as to move mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all that I have, if I deliver up my body to be martyred, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy, nor does it boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist in its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing. It rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Christian service, the Christian life, is one that has lived in love to our Saviour who loved us and gave himself for us. Our Christian life is love to others. Unless you think that I'm starting to sound like a Clinton's card or a Hallmark card, notice this passage here in verse 19. 
Jesus says to Peter, Peter, you're going to be martyred for me. You're going to die for me. What's going to keep you on the path isn't a sense of duty, a sense of religiosity. What's going to keep you on the path is expressive love to me. All Nest Baptist Church, do you love him? Robert, do you love him? That was the question that Christ asked of all of us this morning. Now, Robert, let me turn to you. There's three ways that I can see in this passage for you to express this love to All Nest Baptist Church. First and foremost, preach. Preach the word in season, preach the word out of season. He says, feed my sheep, feed my lambs, feed them with what? Feed them with the living word of God. What we have here is not just a book. What we have here is God's living, active, <coughs> inspired, inerrant, infallible world revealed to us that tells us about him. This, this book is amazing. People aren't interested in politics coming to the church. People don't want to hear your social theories. People don't want to even hear what was on last night's TV, which is rubbish, by the way, anyway. What they want to hear about is the living word of God about the living God to a living church in the power of the Spirit. Preach the word. Be in season, out season. Extort, encourage, rebuke, challenge. Give them God's word. This is God's revelation to us. You want to know who God is? Look to this book and look to his son. Preach the word. Be faithful in it. Many young preachers think they've got a difficult task ahead of them. Perhaps you've heard the story of the young man who got up to preach his first sermon. Has anyone heard this story? The young man got up to preach his first sermon in a, in a Scottish Baptist church, shall we say. And it was his first sermon and he was very nervous and he looked out across the austere faces of the congregation. Some were asleep, some were awake. Some were looking back with their chewing gum being chewed rather violently. And some had their bellies rumbling because they were wanting to go to the capstone centre in a few minutes' time. <laughs> Got up and he preached his first sermon. The first ten minutes were difficult. The congregation wasn't really responding. There was a bit, of, a bit of apathy. And then halfway into the ten minutes, he hears this wonderful voice from the back that says, Hallelujah! The young preacher says, this is great. I've made traction. So he goes on for another ten minutes. The voice from the back even louder says, Hallelujah! Guys, like, this is fantastic. Revival's broken out. He goes on for another 10 minutes. He wraps up a sermon. The guy shouts hallelujah. He goes down to the back afterwards and says to the man, thank you for your great encouragement to me. The man looks puzzled. He says, well, you're, you're, you're saying hallelujah. And the guy goes, son of a saying, that'll do you. <laughs> so, that's a few rooms from him. You should see Noel's face here. It's a picture. Uh, <laughs> Preaching can be difficult sometimes because the message we give and God's word we give isn't always what we want to hear. But bear in mind Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel was called to preach to the valley of dry bones. Actual skeletons. And he preached the Lord's word in the power of the Spirit and the whole thing came alive. Preach God's word in the power of God's Spirit. Give God's people his living word. Secondly, love them by tending the sheep. First 16 there, tending the sheep. Some translations say shepherding the sheep. If you read 1 Peter chapter 5, Peter talks about how he shepherded the flock that Christ had given to him. And he would look after it until the sheep, the sheep, the chief shepherd appears. He would be faithful in looking after them. Shepherd the flock. Tend to them. Do this A, by prayer. Pray for them. Pray for your folk. Prayer is a wonderfully humbling thing for pastors. Because when you have to ask somebody else to do something, you realize how hopeless the task is. But prayer does not fail. I remember my first visit to a hospital bed where I had to, to deal with somebody who got news of terminal illness. And all I could do was say, Lord, help me. And he did. Pray for your folk. Be faithful in prayer. Pray wonderful prayers like Ephesians 3, which if you're interested in coming to hear me preach on tomorrow morning. <laughs> Ephesians 3, verses 14 to 21. Pray that the people would know the love of Christ. The love that surpasses all understanding. <laughs> the the heart. Pray for them. Be care for them. Love them. Answer the distress phone calls, visit the sick, tend to the widow and the orphans, cross the street, break down the barriers of society, go as Jesus went. Care for them. <coughs> Answer their prayer. Or pray for them. Care for them. And lastly, give yourself to them. Your time, your energy, your all. John 10 tells us of the good shepherd who laid down his life for the sheep. Do as Christ did. Lastly, I've got three points because I know that you need to only count the three. <laughs> Personal relationships, verse 17. John's Gospel tells us they shall know you by the love you have for one another. Get to know your people. 
know their work, know where they live, know their family, love them, be in their homes, practice hospitality and fellowship. And by the way, when it says practice fellowship, it's not five minutes over a cup of tea in a Mars bar in the church hall. Fellowship in the Bible is a commitment together for the cause of the gospel. Know your folk in fellowship and personal relationships. J.C. Ryle, coming in this passage, says, Live for others. Care for them. Shepherd others. Minister to others. Do good to others. Seek out and find my sheep in his wicked world. And think it not beneath yourself to care for the feeblest of them. Robert, I charge you to do this and show this love to all nests. All nests. Now, if you don't like what I've got to say, yeah, I'm going away very soon anyway. <laughs> this is a word from all nests too. This is for you... Because you're called to express this love. Robert isn't just called to express this love in isolation. In the Christian body, as Martin said, we're all ministers. We're all in, forgive me for using this, it's an awfully used political phrase nowadays, but we're all in this together for the cause of Christ. All this, let me give you three points for helping Robert and express the love. It's got three M's as well. I worked really hard to get three points and three M's. Firstly, moderate your expectations. Robert will give his all to this church, I can guarantee you that. He will love you and he will serve you faithfully. But he is not Jesus. He is not Jesus. Do not expect him to be a miracle worker. Moderate your expectations. Do not place burdens on him that are unnecessary or expectations that are unrealistic. He is a man who is endowed with God's spirit to serve you. But he is not the Lord. Secondly, marriage. You know, I was having a conversation with Gemma a while back. And Gemma's telling me that most men or husbands would dream of new cars. <laughs> new pulpits. <laughs> dream of new cars or a wonderful DIY project. But her husband dreams of his next sermon series. Gemma, you knew to go up and you said, I do it. But Robert only has one wife. And Gemma only has one husband. The church can have many pastors. But these two are together. Give them their space to grow as husband and wife in this new setting away from family and for friends. Pray for them. Love them. Give Gemma her space to be who she needs to be. Don't put expectations on her as well. Let her find her feet here. Love them both. Care for them. And lastly, maintain. I know some, I know some of this stuff's happening already and all this. So don't worry. I'm not, but I know this is happening. Maintain them. Care for them. Love them. Open your hearts and your home to them. Let him preach and teach to you. Let him pray for you. Don't weigh them down with constant criticism. Bless and encourage them. Show them the love of Christ that they will show you too. Coming from Fife, my congregation is going to grow because I tell this story very often. But I remember the Fifers are, I can say it now because I'm safe outside the key. The Fifers are an interesting bunch. I love them the best. I do. But they're not always the most cheerful people in the world. <laughs> I remember, uh, the is going to grow, I remember crossing the playing fields of Pitt one day. It was beautiful, it was a scorcher of a day. A lovely day. And this man, and I know him, I talk to him all the time, he's walking his dog, he's coming towards me, and I said, oh, we'll say he's called Jimmy. Oh, Jimmy, it's a beautiful day today, isn't it? And he goes, aye. <laughs> but it'll rain tomorrow. <laughs> Don't be like that. God is doing a new thing here in all this. This is an exciting day, but a, a new pastor and a wife will love you and will care for you and give yourself to Be excited, be encouraged, bless them, moderate your expectations, guard their marriage, and maintain them in the love of Christ. If we do this, if we do this, I have no doubt that God will use and bless this fellowship. What that will look like, I don't know. But wouldn't it be great if, as John's Gospel ends, where it says, all the things that Jesus did, we couldn't write books because it would, it would fill the world with books. Wouldn't it be great if I come back in 10 years, which is probably when you'll invite me back again. If I come back in 10 years, we hear the great things that God is doing through this congregation. Because you've shown the love of Christ, you've expressed the love of Christ to each other, and to this community. May the Lord bless you. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you that all this is possible because of you. Because you loved us enough to redeem us, to save us, to rescue us. Did you give your life as a ransom for many on that cross? 
We thank you that for those who trust in you by simple faith that you have brought them into the family of God. <coughs> and we thank you that that message which was preached in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago is now by the power of your spirit and by faithful workers spread to the very north of Scotland. And we now partake in the family of God together. <coughs> we pray that you would continue to sustain this fellowship, that you would sustain Robert and Gemma, bless them. Pour out your spirit upon them. We thank you for them. I thank you for this church family of all this. We have already shown love and care for them and have blessed them in so many ways. Would you bless this church fellowship? And we pray through your love being poured out here that this community, this area, will be impacted by the gospel of Jesus Christ. In word, in deed. Bless this area, we pray, Lord. And may all glory and honour go not to yourselves, but to you. Amen. I think we're starting to sing our next song, right, which is, bless the Lord. <coughs> uh, so Robert, we recognise the grace of God in your calling to ministry, and uh, the particular ministry to which you've been called is here at Old Nest Baptist Church. Ministry is rooted in the local church, and you have been planted here. In fact, you and Gemma have been planted here. So, I wonder if you'd like to just complete, or at least give us the next chapter of the story you told us before. How is it that that call to ministry became a call specifically to All Mess Baptist Church? Yep. Well, in my final year at the Scottish Baptist College, um, there was a discussion going on at Coastline in regard to if my ministry there would continue. Um, and due to financial restraints, um, <coughs> it was unable to continue. So that then began the question and the process of, well, what do Gemma and myself do next? As a part of that uh, call and process, the Board of Ministry had asked me to undertake uh, going to visit different churches uh, within the union of churches and preaching as much as I can to get a, a wider variety of our, our Baptist life. And so that saw me go as far south as Galatians, as far west as uh, the Isle of Butte and to Rossi, um, as far east as coastline because you can't get any further east than East Butte. That's only left one place, how far north can I actually go? And so to that, um, we finished our ministry at Coastline in May of this year. And uh, Jim and myself uh, went to Australia to spend some time with family. And I had received a, an email from Stuart uh, asking me to come uh, as pulpit supply. And so... Gemma and myself decided, well, we'll go see how far north this place really is. And so we, we got up at half five that morning, not knowing how long it would take or if we would ever find it. And, and we, we travelled up the A9, uh, enjoyed the beautiful scenery, got to Inverness, and we thought it couldn't be much further than that, across the Black Isle. Still hadn't found it and, and crossed the bridge. And as, as I was driving down the hill, looking at the valley and into the bridge, there was this great sense of Jeremiah's vision that God had given Jeremiah. He said, seek the welfare of the city where I have placed you, dwell there, take root there, build up life there, and do life with people. And I found that very strange verse for me to be getting and driving into this place. And so I, I preached that Sunday morning and Stuart and myself had a very frank conversation that we weren't sure what was happening or if this was going to amount to anything. And the morning uh, service was a little bit apprehensive. I didn't know the church. The church didn't know me. They didn't know the Irish broke that well at that stage. They've got used to it now. But in the evening we had a, a sense of God was actually maybe considering the beginning to do something. And so Ness invited me back uh, for a weekend to, to preach 
uh, with a view to, to meet with the, the vacancy team uh, to, to spend time. And so as, as we came back, we felt that God was yet again stirring up something. And we took time together, the church as a fellowship and Jim and myself, to pray about it and to seek God's guidance in that. And during this time I had a free week, so I went and visited one of my good friends, John Bergen, up in Brecon. And John said to me after the service, do you feel called there? And I was kind of hit out of the blue by that question. And I'm like, yes, I do. And it says, John, I'll tell you why I feel called there. And it only hit me when John had asked me that question that it was very much like a Jonah situation. But it takes me back to Northern Ireland and to the housing estate that I grew up in. And that I tried to better myself and, and, and do everything that God had asked of me to get myself away from that situation. And as I was here in all this, and a big part of that was finding somewhere where Gemma would also be happy. As Daniel says, Pfeifers are very funny people. <laughs> and trying to get my wife to leave Fife is a near impossible task. But as we drove away from the church that Sunday, there was a great sense of peace. That God, we would be happy here, we would be okay here. And so the church, in their wisdom two weeks later, decided to call me and asked me back to preach a soul nominee. And I came back and we preached and Stuart and myself had a, a wonderful conversation sitting in his uh, conservatory. And he says, how do you feel? And I went, well, there's no alarm bells ringing in my head. And I asked Stuart the question, how do you feel? And Stuart went, afraid. <laughs> I smile from year to year. And he says, I'm afraid that you're going to come and to shake things up. You're going to come and you're going to make us feel uncomfortable and you're going to do things in a different way and you're going to make us think in a different way. And at that point I went, I now understand why God has called me to this place, to this church, for this ministry. And so I preached the Sunday went home and the church voted on the Monday and that's the longest 24 hours. I thought my wedding was bad. <laughs> Nothing on them 24 hours because they said half seven the meeting would start. I said two hours roughly. Like, you know, they, they need to at least come to some consensus. Half nine pass, quarter to ten pass and I'm looking at Jim and Jim's looking at me and we're going. Uh, and at ten to ten Stuart phoned and he says, You've received the sufficient vote. And at that point, Gemma was skipping up the street with her mother in tow. And I said, I believe this is what God is calling us to. And so we come to this point today. Thank you, Robert. Well, praise God. What a good thing. And what a, what a, what a, what a process where God has been with you each step of the way. I'm going to ask Stuart Chalmers to come and to say, from the church's point of view, how the Lord led on this Baptist church to extend his call to ministry to Robert. Martin warned me to be brief. <laughs> and given that Robert has told most of the story, I'll be even briefer. Well, <clears throat> where to begin? Well, I guess the obvious place to begin is when our previous pastor left. That was in March 2015, uh, when Ian was called to Fort William Baptist Church. And we found ourselves once again in uh, vacancy. Now, that's not a common event for all this Baptist Church. This was only our third vacancy. Our previous pastors have all been long servants to this fellowship. And we look forward to Robert being a long servant to this fellowship. As, a, as we went into vacancy, as a leadership and congregation, we felt there was no need to rush into searching for God's servant for this church. One of the best pieces of advice we received during the last vacancy was, take time, 
get the last pasta out of your system. And that's not intended with any slight whatsoever. But it's purely, it avoids any sense of comparison of one to the other. So we were in no rush. But eventually, in October 15, we, at a church meeting, we decided, yeah, it's maybe time we thought about doing something about getting a new pastor. Uh, and during the discussions, we talked about the process of we see, talking with the Baptist Union and getting profiles. And, uh, but we all felt that our previous pastors had all come from word of mouth referrals. And we felt a strong calling that that's the way our new pastor would come. Yes, we would work with Martin and we would get some profiles and we would look at those. But we always felt that word of mouth referral was far more than anything we could discern for ourselves through the profiles. Plus that didn't become our out and out policy, it certainly played a large part in our thinking. And so it was in March this year that we got Robert's name as someone, as a fellowship we might consider to come and be our pastor. Uh, Robert says email, I said quick call, would you? <laughs> but we made contact with Robert and uh, we arranged for him to come up in July for that uh, COVID supply following their visit to Australia. Now at this stage, the, the leadership of the church were aware it might turn into something more than just pulpit supply. <clears throat> For the fellowship at that point, they weren't so aware it was just pulpit supply. But from all the positive feedback that came from the fellowship, the leadership then decided, yes, we need to take this further. We need to explore, is this God's <coughs> will for this fellowship? And so we spoke with Martin, and we sought Martin's guidance, and he gave us some direction. <coughs> and so at this point, and only at this point, did we formally set up a vacancy committee. We had done it all as a leadership, uh, because we weren't in a rush. And there was no sense of rush from the fellowship. But we thought, at this point, let's take this a step further. We set up a vacancy committee. A lot of time spent in prayer and in soul searching. And we felt then it would be good to bring Robert and Gemma back to come and see all this. And as Robert said, we brought them back for a weekend. We had heard Robert come and preach and share God's word. And being from Northern Ireland, we felt sure that his word would be sound anyway. We didn't see that as being a problem. But we wanted as a church, we wanted to see Robert outside the church. We wanted to see Robert and Gemma as a couple. It's an important step for someone to come and pastor a church. And we wanted to see them outside the formal setting of a church. So they came and we had a fellowship with them and we found that they won Mr. and Mrs. <laughs> the newest weights in, in, in the gathering. They knew more about each other than the rest of us who have been together for many of the year. So we found out that there was fun and there was seriousness. On the Saturday, as Robert said, uh, we met with the uh, vacancy committee and apparently the phrase was, we asked them some doozies of questions. <laughs>